What is up, guys? It's the Sound Alchemist, back in red, and I'm here with... Gersh1, always in, in black or gray or blue. Dour colors for your boy. Yeah, Blanchitsu. No, he's more like grays and browns, right? I would say so, yeah. And welcome back to another... I was, the, to, I was about to say 40 facts. <laughs> for the greater... <laughs> I just got an eyelash that fell from my eyelashes into my <laughs> mouth. That was weird. Whoa. This is a video series where we answer the questions left by you, the viewer. If you have a question for us, comment down below. Put question in front of your question because we get to those questions first. first. Now, this um, greater wall is going to be a little bit different because last week the Sound Alchemist wasn't here. So I asked you guys to come up with theories as to why the Sound Alchemist wasn't there. And you guys came up with a lot of good stuff that surprisingly weren't that gay. <laughs> yeah. So sporadically we'll throw those theories out yeah, there sporadic that's an interesting word but this major question comes from all might he asks what's the best type of unit to buy first troops hq etc that's an interesting question because whenever i think about starting uh, any army in 40k i always go with hqs yeah i could see why because mm -hmm. i feel like your hq depending on the auras and abilities you kind of build around them yeah so, like, if you're going with, like, a Space Marine Captain, they're generally good at giving rerolls. So then, from there, you kind of want to get more ranged units that are going to hit hard. Yeah. Um, like, low attacks, but high damage output. So that way, when you're rerolling the, the dice, like, there's ch better chances of them doing those big damage. Yeah, so the HQ really plays in into the synergy of your mm -hmm. entire army on the tabletop, which is uh, a crucial thing. Um yeah, so I see why you would want to do that. However, there's different ways you can go about it. Yeah, and the, the reason that I say that is because of the fact of the starter sets. or Yeah, the starter sets themselves gives you an HQ choice, and usually that HQ choice is what GW is trying to sell mm -hmm. because they have too much of, so it's usually not the best. Um, an example of that is the Orc um, HQ choice is a pain boy. I don't even think in this edition he's an HQ choice anymore. Um, but it is one of those situations where it's like, no, you don't want to go with, like, a good solid army might have a pain boy, it's nice, but the core HQ choice should be, like, a Big Mac or a War Boss. Mm -hmm. um, I think same thing for the tower, right? Yeah, well, I guess it depends. An ethereal? Yeah, ethereals are just really good at, like, gun lines. They give a bunch of bonuses, uh, but they're squishy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most often you see people running Tau Commanders. Um, either in like cold star battle suits or they're literally just a support where you don't give them any weapons and it's all just supplementary uh, war gear to like give out like rerolls or stuff like that yeah but as you can see like the hq really dictates the direction of your your war bands growth mm -hmm. uh, i really like the concept of like the crusade creating war bands because now i think of my army in a different way like before i used to think like when i'm collecting my army i just want to buy what's cool yeah but now like you really have like that um idea that this is a war band so the general is important but you do see how like the hq is a big important part of of, of you choosing what your war band's direction will be mm -hmm. Um, so I, I actually do like that. You could also go with troops, though. Um, troops is something that you're gonna have to buy, right? Like Regardless, it's a necessity. Yeah. yeah. No matter what edition it is, troops claim objectives. They're like the heart and the meat of any army. Yeah. Now you have to be careful because GW usually throws out like between two to five options for troops, uh, depending on the army. Um, and usually you have like an elite version of the troop and then a regular version of the troop. What I have found from, I've played 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th edition, or 9th edition, um, getting the basic ass like troop. troop is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to make art boys. I'm not trying to make like these like uh, special uh, like orcs with like all these weapons and stuff like that. Just regular boys. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's pretty good. Um, for multiple reasons, really, because usually the regular troop is the cheapest, and you could get a bunch of them. So the more bodies you have on the field, the more shots you're going to get off, the harder it is to take you off, off objectives. Yeah, and always go on eBay, because mm -hmm. troop choices right now, like, what's the cheapest box at? Probably like $35, $40? Right. Um, actually, I think it's the Necron Warriors. I think it's like a box of like 10 or 20 
for like 40 bucks. Damn. But for 40 bucks, you can get the, I think it's like a, one of those like start collecting boxes. Oh, yeah. And you have Space Marines and Necrons on there. So you literally get more bang for your buck by going that route instead of just buying them separately. Yeah, so be smart and go on the forums and kind of like learn prices mm -hmm. before you end up buying the stuff. Unless you just want to go with a starter, like you said. Yeah. Um, because um, another option is like eBay. If you go on eBay, troop choices have always stayed steady at $20, mm -hmm. um, which is weird. Like eBay sellers know that like this sells at $20, we're going to just keep it at $20. Right. Obviously, you could find cheaper stuff or higher price if it's built, painted. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but like regular stuff is just that. But yeah, between troops and HQ, HQ. I think is is the most important unit mm -hmm. of 40k. Just from there, everything else is pretty much just like support in a way. Yeah, it's like oh, I need something that's fast, fast attack. Oh, I need something that's durable, heavy support. Oh, I need a more specific unit, elite. Yeah, yeah. But then uh, that also highlights how the HQ is so important because mm -hmm. like let's say you do want to go with like fast attack. And you better get an HQ that buffs up or synergizes really well with your fast attack. Right, because if you're playing White Scars and your HQ is just a regular captain, he's going to be all the way in the back yeah, while the whole army is up there. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure you get him like jetpacks or bikes, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's really the fun part of, of 40k is like sitting down and thinking of a warband. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. So if you guys don't play the tabletop, do it. Yeah. Even if you're not going to play, at least map out and make out an army. Because once you have an army that you like and like looks cool and you start making lore for it, chances are you're probably going to start buying pieces here and there. Right. Yeah. Good question. Next uh, one. This next one is by um, Nic Nicholas Barrera. <laughs> what do you think if Gilliman faces Shadow Sun in a battle? Do you think they will talk first or will they fight without talking? And what do you think would happen in that battle? So will Primarch Gilliman against the commander of the Tau, Shadow Sun? Um, I don't see any reason for the Tau and the Space Marines to team up right now. Um, they both got different things going on. Um, so if they probably met, they'd probably just fight. And obviously a Primarch's going to win. Yeah, especially with that whole thing that happened to the Tau with the... Um, Star Tide Nexus. Yeah, so what was that? like? So basically the Tau were trying to expand out from their controlled area of space. And whenever they expand, they expand in spheres. So like, here's like the core and then the next expansions are bigger and then bigger and bigger. But with the introduction of the Star Tide Nexus, which was like an experimental type of uh, module, okay. it allowed them to travel deep into space um, so instead of building another sphere they would pop up like all the way up here um, however Zeech had a play on it and they ended up going into the warp the Tau got crazy when they exited the warp um, the Tau were killing their auxiliaries because they thought they were like monsters or something uh, but they did establish um, a little base in that segment of space and then um, eventually a drone came out the Tau Empire found the drone and they're like, oh, okay, so this is what happened to that exploratory fleet. And then Shadow Sun went into the Nexus and ended up over there. So essentially, they've got a wormhole portal that goes from one point of the galaxy to the other. Yeah. Now, it, the Star Tide Nexus is just skimming the warp, right? Right. It doesn't necessarily go into the warp, but it's like skipping a rock on water. Yeah. Uh, and, and the big important part about that is that if Gilliman and Shadow Sun meet, I think because Shadow Sun has that understanding that like, oh, these guys have the the access to these warp, what did you call them, like wormholes? Because mm -hmm. probably the Tau think of them as wormholes. Right. Uh, then th yeah, it is straight up aggression because it's like they have the better ship. Right. Uh, so that would be interesting. Or they could just make out the whole time. They could, yeah, because mm -hmm. she is a, a female with a nose. Right. And Gilliman loves noses. Mm -hmm. That's something that I didn't include in the 40 facts about Gilliman. He loves, loves noses. noses. Yeah. <laughs> um, another cool thing that uh, that whole thing highlights is how 40K is sci-fi fiction. And the fiction part is this chaotic, like, uh, warp stuff. Mm -hmm. So for a true sci-fi race like the Tau... 
to experience the warp, which is what happened when they were uh, hopping through the Star Titan Nexus. It just shows them how, like, it just psychologically messed them up. And it makes me think of, like, Cthulhu and stuff, which oh, is cool. Yeah. Madness and trying to understand something that can't be understood. Because it's magic. Mm-hmm. And it's fantasy. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. So whenever, like, people, uh, especially newcomers, discuss um, 40K in, like, sci-fi um, boundaries or whatever, it's like, no, 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 no. This is basically, like, the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It's magic. But isn't magic just science that's un, un understood? To a certain level, because I do think that, like, sure, you, we can get down to the nitty gritty of what a demon is, mm-hmm. but that would all just be. What does uh, Joe Rogan say? Um, ha <laughs> I don't know what he says. <laughs> Next question. Uh, Simon Tees. If a Xenos race, for example, the Tau, found a way of sealing up the warp tears in real space, for example, the Eye of Terror, how would that affect the 40k galaxy? So if a Xenos race found a way to close warp portals or warp webways, warp anomalies, that's big, that's huge, because that's what the Necrons were doing like thousands of years ago, Um, and that's pretty much what the Imperium needs to do. Uh, in order to seal off chaos for good. Which is why Blackstone is so important. Mm -hmm. So Blackstone is actually the Adeptus Mechanicus trying to understand the pylons of Cadia, which were holding back the Eye of Terror. Mm -hmm. And eventually they were destroyed because Abaddon decided to (laughs) dive his his, ship into it, or his Blackstone Fortress into it, which is kind of funny. (laughs) He used Blackstone to kill Blackstone. It's like uh, Thanos using the stones to destroy the stones. Yeah, basically like that. Um, poetic justice it is poetic justice but yeah that's what the Cicatrice Maledictum is all about and that is why the Necrons probably are going to have trouble with the Imperium because the Imperium knows about Blackstone now Mm -hmm. and the Imperium is actually going out and mining for Blackstone which now you have a resource that is like not human lives that the Necrons (laughs) care about Mm -hmm. that the Imperium doesn't have or shouldn't have Right. Yeah. Should they have it? I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. En un dos por tres ya acaban. Yeah, for real. Because mm-hmm. they're, they're, there's millions of them, so they can mine it forever. Right. I mean, look at all the Minecraft YouTubers. Exactly. That's the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're doing like speed runs and stuff. Nice. How do you speed run Minecraft? <laughs> <laughs> this question goes from D. Rich. Can destroyer cults inflate one's curse or... And, and the Flayed Ones curse exists in the same tomb world. So the Destroyer cult is just a madness of wanting to destroy things. Yeah. And then the Flayed Ones is you want to wear, the, you want to have your body back. So they like skin people and wear it. Yeah. I can see why, like, I don't see why not. I feel like Destroyer cults are usually more for the upper echelons of the Necron Dynasty. And then the lower dynasty would be the filleted ones, Mm -hmm. which is why any tomb, no, why any Necron dynasty can have filleted ones, because there could be a portion of troops that have the filleted one virus. Right. So, yeah. And it's filleted ones, not filleted ones. It's filleted because Shinto. Mm. Did you know that Shinto is a little, like altars that they have in japan to like commemorate the gods or whatever or the nature gods Hmm. shinto is like a restaurant here in our area so whenever i go i think of princess mononoke which is an actually really good uh is that an anime yeah 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 i saw that recently again it's really good it is jacob cubhurt why can only the Grey Knights use baby carriers, a.k.a. the Nemesis Dread Knights? And if I wanted to make a homebrew chapter that wasn't a successor of Grey Knights, could I still use those said baby carriers, as long as I have a good reason to use it in my own lore? Claro. Sure. Why not? Did you post this back in, like, 2017? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are bar- baby carriers in other factions now. Yeah. Um, the Primaris Marines have them. With the Invictor Tactical War Suit, I think is what it's called. It's basically a dreadnought, but you can see the dude carrying it. Yeah. 
um, in the Sisters of Battle, we'll be getting something very much like that. I, I, I think it looks cool. At first, when it came out, I thought it was dumb. But, like, after looking at it, I'm like, no, it's pretty cool. I still don't get the concept. Why expose yourself to everything like that? Why not wear a helmet? <laughs> yeah. You know? Like, the Sisters of Battle, like, the, the ones that look cool are the ones with the helmeted ones. But when I say just the regular sister face with, like, the... That's because si- sister faces are ugly. In general, all unhelmeted heads, I don't like. No, because the Adeptus Custodis, they have really cool heads. Well, that's because they're like more machine than anything. So even if they take off their helmet, it's still like a f- helmet in my eyes. But they have cool haircuts. They have like uh, <laughs> man buns and uh, what is that? Um, mohawks. See, that's the thing that I hated about the Space Wolves, their hair. That's true. They have like goofy ass hair. Mm-hmm. Like there's one dude who's like half shaved and then the other half is just like sticking Thick and straight up. up. Yeah. yeah. That model, I, the bit box behind you is full of that head <laughs> because I never used it. But yeah. I mean, it depends. Yeah, it depends on your aesthetic. I think you also need to learn how to paint um, flesh and all that. Yeah, which is it's not that hard. If you go to the Warhammer TV uh, YouTube channel, uh, they have a bunch of how-tos. Como? And it's just like three steps. So it's a, like a flesh tone, a red wash, and a highlight of like a cream. So fresh and so cream, cream. Cream, cream. Next question. Uh, Cole. Just the wholesome name, Cole. Are there different languages in 40K, like English, but also French and Spanish? Um, Keep up the great content. There is. So each planet has their own individual dialect, Mm -hmm. even though um, within the the imperial dialects, it's high Gothic, low Gothic, and then whatever the machine cult believes in or speaks in. Right, which is like... It has a name. What is it called? Beep boop 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 beep boop 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 boop. <laughs> is that from Nickelodeon? It is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah just like that. Mm-hmm. They speak in Matrix. Yeah. But yeah, they they have different languages. We haven't gotten to any theories. Oh, this one's a theory. Um, this one's by Reject X Seven. He's trying to revive his missing Primark. Aren't we all, bro? Aren't we all? You actually did. Oh, yeah, I gave him mouth-to-mouth and chest compressions. Mm -hmm. And now he's... What is the name of your missing Primark? Uh, Alec Elric. Check out the playlist. I actually uh, made another installment in the lore for the Codex. Uh, Two years in the making, believe it or not. Yeah. Because I did parts one through four, like, two years ago. And then I had, like, a huge brain fart and, like, writer's block. And now I finally put out part five. Only six more parts to go. <laughs> six more parts. Yeah. I have a theory from Dragon Punch 903. Uh, he asks, or he says, Ask not where the sound alchemist is, but why the dude got a beak. I'm perplexed by this new predilition. Predilection? Predile- predicament. <laughs> Sorry, I can't read. Um, Do I have a beak? And what are beaks made of? Keratin. Mm, so it's like nails? Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Like sharp, sharp nails. Mm. That's probably wrong, but balls are stored in... Or <laughs> balls are stored in the pee? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like float, <laughs> like ice. Did you know ice was rock? <laughs> no, for real. Like, ice is rock. So that means that water is lava. I uh, take offense to that. <laughs> We are basically mag... No. We are basically lava monsters. I thought you say magmar. Uh, he is a lava monster. Yeah. And he's got a beak. <gasps> Damn. I'm a magmar. So where is the beak? Um, In me trompita. Inside? Mm-hmm. I just gotta, like, push hard and it comes out. Yeah. Nice. That's cute, too. <laughs> this next one is by Justin Casey. Like, just in case? Cool. What exactly is Forge World? How does it relate to 40k? I'm new to the hobby, and I collect the figures for Starfinder, and I'm dabbling with TT. Not too sure what that could be. I also looked at Forge World, and I was confused. So Forge World is kind of like a... Specialist um, third party. Yeah. But not really because they're part of uh, GW. GW. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, they specialize in 30k stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, um, if you're trying to play the Horus Heresy, um, if you're trying to get like old school, like different type of marine armor, that's where you gotta go. But the cool thing too about the just the lore behind 40k is that a lot of the old 30k stuff should have should still exist. Mm -hmm. It's very rare. But, like, your chapter is supposed to be very unique, too. Like, your homebrew chapter. So, if you ever want to buff up or, like, spruce up some of your models, um, buy Forge World bits and then play them as 40K bits. Mm -hmm. um, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, it's yeah, it is just, like, another tabletop game. Right. Um, I think there... If you play the, the 30K version of 40K, <laughs> uh, their rule sets are still in 7th edition. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, like they never like progressed to like eighth or ninth. Yeah, but if you, it depends on what faction you play, because if you play Imperial Guard, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. You're gonna spend more money, but the models are gonna look way better than what you get right now at oh, GW. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, so like, pay attention to the least um, uh, updated armies, because usually you have like a fresh look. Mm -hmm. uh, I. The Tau, do the Tau have anything other than the crew? Yeah, the, well, a lot of their stuff went to, like, uh, like it got discontinued. Um, but, yeah, the, the Tau battle suits had, like, a sleeker design, uh, different types of, like, armaments. Um, and then you can buy a bunch of their, like, warships, like the Tiger Shark, that kind of stuff. You could only get that in Forge World. Yeah. So they kind of specialize in like the bigger mm -hmm. models. They're titans you can get in Forge World. Yeah, so point value, like if you if you and your friends are playing Apocalypse games or playing like bigger games, Forge World would be really good for you mm -hmm. if you have the cash for it. Yeah, because it's really expensive That's... and it's all resin, I believe. Yeah, yeah, which isn't that hard to mm -hmm. build and paint, but yeah, yeah, it's a little different than regular forty k stuff. But those were the questions for today. If you guys have more questions for, or you know what, let's read a theory. One more theory because we've only done one, right? Oh yeah, I think so. Or two, two, two. <laughs> so this theory is um, the top theory, Ooh. and that was that he's hanging out with Bridget B. And that brings us to another portion of this, which uh, so her OnlyFans is free right now, guys. Oh, it's like paid for quality stuff. But for free. I was about to say, I haven't uh, delved into the Bridget B in a while. I think this is my uh, green light. And make sure that when you subscribe to her OnlyFans, let her know that One Mind Syndicate sent you. So just spam it and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. Probably nothing. <laughs> Do you have another theory? Uh, Johannes says he's got a big titty Tau GF or maybe a BF. I like the inclusivity. Yeah, very uh, kind of you to think about me that way. <laughs> <laughs> this question or this theory comes from Heron Royer. Sound Alchemist got a part-time job at Portillo's. Hey, I yeah. wish. Where them uh, ceviche tacos at? They don't have that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks for answering my question. Uh, chocolate cake shake, which wasn't is it's not as good as it used to be. Mm -hmm. And but. if you guys are still here, quick question for for you guys: When you guys get what is it the uh that beef sandwich what's it called italian beef the italian beef do you guys prefer it wet or dry if you say anything other than soaking wet like um shadow suns <laughs> you know what after talking to gilliman um then just just unsubscribe i don't need you in my life <laughs> and if you say anything other than desert dry resubscribe because wet is how do you eat wet bread how that's just slime going down your throat one day we're gonna lose our teeth <laughs> and when that day comes i'm going to buy you a uh soaking wet italian beef and, and i'm gonna say still not gonna eat it no yeah you will you, you'll be like oh this is perfect because it just slides down my gullet <laughs> mm, soupy bread just what i want <laughs> yeah well that and like Hot peppers. You got to get the hot peppers. Oh, and then you get the cheese, right? The yeah, I put mozzarella on it. Yeah, and delicious. even better is I put cheese fries on it, too. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Comment down below. <laughs> Those were the questions for today and the theories. Yeah. And uh, our question to you, too.
There's a lot happening in this War of the Greater Wall. It is. It's complex. This was Gershwin. <laughs> the Sound Alchemist. Out. <laughs> Put my freedom back in any situation.